only 5'6", so I can pull the stool up. Me too, bro. <laughs> Good afternoon, church. Where's Austin? Is Austin here? Where is he? Well, that was a great reminder by Austin to let us know that we'll never be alone with, um, with God. And where's Madison? Madison, great job with the announcements. Uh, sad to see you leave, but... Uh, You'll be back soon, right? Thanksgiving or something? Uh, and uh, Kaden? There he is. Um, yeah, it is hard to keep an oath when it hurts, but you know, as long as it's for God, then it should be no problem, right? Anyway, this is Young Gun Sunday. Uh, my auntie and uncle and uh, my cousin came to visit recently, and I was just telling them before I, uh, I left after dinner, I was just telling them, that, oh, you know, I'm 29 years old, and my uncle was telling me, oh, that's not old, and, but I was telling him, on the inside I feel old, like, and uh, for those who haven't hit 29 yet, you'll learn. <laughs> you'll learn. Anyway, let's, let's get our Bibles open to uh, Matthew 28. How's everyone doing? Good? That's good, that's good to you. Okay, so we'll be in Matthew 28. Um, we'll start in verse 16. The Bible says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. So I just want to paint a picture for everybody here. Imagine that you're living in the year 33 AD. Uh, you've just seen firsthand Jesus Christ, the Son of God, living on earth. He witnesses death, burial, and resurrection, the miracles he performed, uh, the pain he suffered on the cross. Some doubt, but you don't. Before he ascends back into heaven, he has a few choice words for the believers. Here's what he said. Let's continue on in verse 18. The Bible says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The title of our lesson, The Great Commission. I'll be, for, I'll be uh, focusing on the first part of the scripture, and I'm going to be talking about making a disciple. Um, the Bible calls us to make disciples of all nations, um, everywhere you go. We're not limited to just uh, the nation of Israel anymore. Everywhere, on the streets, at your home, on the job. <laughs> I would say all alone, but I, I don't really get that last part, to be honest. But, you know, maybe you can get on Facebook or something and, uh, you know, message yeah. somebody. But uh, I, looked up, I also looked up the definition for go, and it's a verb. It's what you do, going to depart, to take a certain course or to follow a certain procedure. And Jesus, in verse 18, he tells us to follow a simple, certain procedure. Go make a disciple. Uh, Jesus used his authority on earth to call us to make disciples. Amen. And some of you might be asking, what's a disciple? Well, let's see the biblical definition. Let's go to Mark 1. So we're, we'll be in uh, Mark 1, in verse 16. And the Bible says, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once, they left their nets and followed him. So here we see a disciple is a true follower of Jesus. Um, upon hearing the call, when did they leave? They left at once. Many times we can make excuses, you know, I hear a lot, we're too busy. I'm, I'm, I'm busy, but <laughs> I'm, I'm sure a lot of us are busy. Uh, we can be too comfortable with where we are in life. 
Yeah. Can have a lack of caring, lack of ambition, too much drama at home, too much drama at school, too much drama at work, drama on TV. <laughs> These fishermen left their jobs of fishing to fish for men. Be why? Because they were called to do so um, by Jesus. In John 1.1, 1, 1, we know Jesus is God and you don't say no to God when he tells you to do something. Uh, let's look at another example of someone who was called to be a fisher of men and more specifically a, a fisher of this, this one man. Let's go to Acts 8. So be before I read the passage, um, I'm going to talk, talk about this guy, Philip. Um, he met this uh, man uh, while he was preaching the good news and performing miracles in Samaria, the middle region of Israel. And he was scattered from his brothers at the time due to persecution, but was still faithful and continued to obey Jesus and build, a, build up the kingdom there. And after some time, God sends a message to Philip instructing him where to go next. And here's what was said. We'll be in uh, Acts 8, verse 26. So the Bible says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means Queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in the ch his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading, Philip asked? How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before a shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. So this Ethiopian eunuch was seeking God with his whole heart, and eventually... Him and Philip cross paths, and um, Philip then makes this eunuch into a disciple. And uh, he explained to them, uh, he explained to the eunuch the passage in the book of Isaiah. And I gotta think he explained to him many more passages, eventually leading up to his realization that, oh yeah, I need to get baptized. Um, so Philip was called by God to be sent into the world to make this disciple the Ethiopian eunuch as well as many more disciples. Besides Philip, who else do you think God calls to make disciples? Let's see in the book. I will. Let's see in the book of Isaiah. Let's, go to, let's turn to Isaiah 6. So we'll be in verse 8. And the Bible says, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. We as disciples and aspiring disciples should be saying, God, here am I, send me. Send me to make disciples of all nations. And after we were out, we're scattered, um, the next step would to be to baptize them. And here to talk about baptism, our awesome brother, Kainalu. Hey man, let's give a hammer call. I love you, Mike. <laughs> man. Alright, so I'm kind of nervous, man. You know you have the light thing in your chest, like, you want to like, fight, right? Or, like, I never got to fight before, but amen. 
Um, but anyways, um, so now's the time of uh, the lesson we're talking about baptism. Amen. It's a very controversial topic and a very topic that um, has been well known throughout the world, yet so top wrong throughout the world for more than 2,000 years. And they all try to distort that passage from the same book, the Bible. But we all know that in Ephesians 4, the Bible says there was only one baptism, one way, one truth, one life, and one way to salvation. And we all know here that that is through the Bible, amen? Yeah. Uh, turn your Bibles to Matthew 28. It's a few pages over, amen? <coughs> And uh, you know, over there, who watched that? Not your Libre. Alright, so there are quite a few people, so you guys know what I'm talking about, man. But you know the scene where, um, Nacho is like, he's over there, and um, he goes to that skinny guy that you saw on the street eating the, the large cheese. Right? And he's like, uh, I don't believe in God. I believe in science. And then Nacho goes, You might have been baptized. <laughs> So he goes, you know, casually, fills up this bowl of water on the back, sneakily behind like a cat, right? And he goes, uh, finish the water! <laughs> finish the But you see, even Nacho Libre knew that you had to be baptized! Amen? Amen. And today, let's go to Matthew 28, to verse 18. Very famous passage, but the Bible says here. Okay. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've granted you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now here what's happening is that Jesus has already died. He was buried, and now he's resurrected. Can you imagine the resurrected Jesus standing before you? The scary sight. This guy already died. He saw death. He tasted death. But he overcame it by the power of God. And he, God raised him to life. Can you imagine the power this guy is feeling right now? Dude, I'm up to this. Dude preached about the kingdom of God for 40 days straight. How important is that? And in John chapter 3, Jesus says there's only one way to enter that kingdom of God. as to be born again. To be baptized. We call that water baptism. You know, verse 19, he says, go make disciples, like how Tal was saying. And after you make this disciple, you baptize them. So in this passage, what does Jesus want everybody to become? A disciple. But not just a disciple, a baptized disciple. Amen. You see, the Bible says here clearly you make a disciple and then you baptize them. Right? Again, the importance of the baptism. And after you have baptized them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you teach them to obey if you think it's command us. Amen? Yeah. Um, the message was and is you must be baptized. That's the, the title of my point. You must be baptized. Amen? Let's go to Acts chapter 2. You know, Jesus knew that that was the only way mankind could be saved. Was through being made to a disciple and then being water baptized. Now, that Jesus is the Son of God, and actually He is God Himself. If God says so, there's no other way, man. There's just no way behind that. I mean, you can't get more wrong. I'm going to get baptized in milk. Baptized in some juice. You know, I love Gatorade, so it's not the Gatorade. It has water in it, right? Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Like here, the, all the apostles, are, um, some prophecies being fulfilled here. And in the coming of the kingdom study, we have this list of prophecies that are being checked off as we go and study. And um, at this passage, we have the final prophecies being checked off. And remember now, in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus gives Peter, or Cephas, the keys to the kingdom of God. Not a physical building, but to the people, the disciples, the family of the leaders. Peter, over here, he addresses the crowd. He raises up his voice and he says in verse 36, Therefore let all of Israel be assured of this. 
God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now what happens at baptism? Well, we all know it's the point of salvation. That's the point where your sins are forgiven. Amen. Number one, your sins are forgiven in verse 38. Number two, you receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, also in verse 38. And the Bible says in Romans 8 that those who do not have the Spirit of Jesus do not belong to Christ. Thus, this is very important. Number three, you're saved. You're saved. How awesome is that? It's pretty awesome. You know when you type that long essay? And like, you forget to save it. And it's like, it's only a short 80 page essay and like you just, the power goes off all of a sudden. And you reboot everything and then wipe everything out. And it was due today because you procrastinated. <laughs> What's with your head? But how refreshed would you be if, if, it, if it would have said, save? <laughs> Being saved is refreshing, amen? Number four, you were added to God's kingdom. Let's continue reading. Verse 39. <clears throat> Says the promises for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. This promise is for everybody. Jesus wants all men to become saved. Hence, Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Make disciples of all nations. Not just Jews. Not just Gentiles. All nations. Verse 40. With many other wonders, with many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and three, about 3,000 were added to the number that day. Could you imagine giving enough water for that? 3,000 people added to God's kingdom in that same day. At this point, there are 120 disciples preaching this word. And about 3,000 were added to the number that day. There are now 3,120 disciples in the kingdom of God. That's pretty awesome. It's amazing to see souls saved. You know, I really appreciate uh, Casey and Charity. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, they're being baptized four and five minutes after service. Uh, but I think you all know that because uh, we're here for announcements, amen. But um, just to see a soul added, I remember when I was added to God's kingdom, um, July 3rd, 2016. Um, I was scared. Well, bro, bro, why are we scared? It's the best thing. Yeah, exactly. But, so, like, uh, you know that feeling when your life is about to end? You think you're gonna die? I was like, <laughs> and and Nate Carr was preaching the lesson. He moved to walk with him. He's preaching the lesson. I'm sitting in front like, my heart's like, you know, 120 beats a minute, right? Like, you don't want to do it. And then he's like, oh, you know, can I only get baptized? I'm like, oh. <laughs> and it begins to water. And I remember going to the water with the uh, chemo, Mark, and Nate. And the water is rough and peaky, right? And we had the time the waves and everything. And I'm like. Look at the crowd, everybody here was there. Uh, almost everybody here was there. And I look in there like, do I still want to do this? You know? I have to really count the cost on my head. But you know what that tells me? That tells me that baptism is not an emotional decision. It's a sober decision. You know, Thomas still got married. Uh, yeah, anyone was here, January 5th, I think. Yeah, January 5th, right. Uh, but you see, even marriage is not an emotional decision, right? Imagine if it was. Yeah, after you get married, like, I don't really feel the same thing about this girl. I don't really feel the same about this girl. I think they were stable. I wonder if I can forge a signature on the divorce papers. Because I was just so happy at that moment. Oh, yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm about, yeah. And then, like, I woke up the next morning. I'm like, I don't feel the same anymore. Baptism is not an emotional decision. You gotta sit down. You gotta count the cost. The Bible says in Luke 14 that disciples count the cost. To see if you want to be a disciple. It's not an overnight thing unless you stay up all night and then you can do that, for sure. Trent, fastest conversion in the, in the church. But 15 hours, 12 hours? It was less than 24 hours. And me and Dennis were in there and um, we're kind of sore. It's a dollar day. But um, the decision was radical. 
let me ask you something. If you're visiting us here today, are you going to do whatever it takes to be baptized? But I think the first question for that is, do you see the importance? Do you know what happens at baptism? Uh, you know, I was baptized by this other guy before, way, um, years before that, I was 13 years old. And uh, I had no idea about any of this. But they're using the same Bible. And so that told me something. I said, that probably means that if disciples make disciples, and I didn't know this, that means that that person that baptized me back then was not a disciple. Therefore, I just got wet. So, so I want to ask you here today, if you got baptized already, and you're not sure if it's a biblical conversion or not, just get together the person who just who brought you out today and just see like through the Bible what the Bible says. To see what the truth says. I want to do whatever it takes to do it God's way, amen? Yes. Speaking of dying, let's go to Romans chapter 6. You must be baptized. There's a must in there, not a should, not a can. You must be baptized. Romans 6 verse 1. It says, uh, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism in order into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. What happens at baptism? You take participation in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Did you know that there is no water baptism without the resurrection of Jesus Christ? You know, there's more than one scripture that talks about that. That's why we use the whole Bible. Amen. You can't just use one scripture and make that your whole plan of salvation when God gave us the whole Bible. Amen. Amen. Are you with you on that? Yeah. Amen. So, you know, we have a cute diagram that we, we go over with the scripture, and it's simply of a cross here. Jesus said, he, he nailed all your sins to the cross. As each of you guys here, and me, myself, a little more so myself. He crucified our sins on the cross. He, he got buried, and he resurrected. In the same way, and he was raised to the glory of the Father, so God raised him from the dead, amen? Acts 2, 22, 24. Um, and in a spiritual sense for us, we take participation in that. How's that? We take our old life. We crucify it. We choose to die to our old self, die to our sins, our enslaving us. All the impurity, debauchery, drunkenness, whatever you can think of, anger, malice, bullying, I don't know what else we want, whatever it is we have. Um, we crucify it and we, we bear with, with Jesus in the waters of baptism. And he cleans us out. He cleans, he scrubs all that out of us. Yeah. Scrub. You're the carpenter, man. He's sanding this wood out. <laughs> and, then, and then when you come out of the water, you're raised to a new life. You're not living the same life anymore. You're not enslaved to the same sins anymore. You're a slave to God. Amen. Amen. You know, if you're a visitor today, I have one challenge for you today. Get in the water. You know, someone might ask, after baptism, now what? Well, Trent, talk about that. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, guys. Wow. Well, uh, thanks, Todd, for uh, showing us what the Bible says about making disciples and, of course, this great commission that we have. Uh, to go and to make disciples for all nations. That includes everybody. And kind of thank you for just cutting through that Gordian knot, the sort of truth. Amen. <laughs> Gordian knot is, is a knot that's so entangled, it's not even, you can't even get undone, you have to cut it. So you just cut through about 2,000 years of Gordian knot doctrine. So thank you for that. Well, here we are. The third point of the Great Commission, which is to teach to obey. Teach to obey. You know, many churches out there teach a great number of things. Uh, some of them true, some of them maybe not true. 
uh, some of them biblical, some of them maybe not biblical. And we do teaching as well in this church. We absolutely teach. But we do more than just simply teach the word. We teach obedience to the word. You know, this is what sets us apart from different churches. You know, there are churches out there that teach correctly on discipleship, on repentance, what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Uh, but maybe they don't teach everything else. There are churches out there that teach baptism correctly. That baptism is the point where your sins are forgiven and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But maybe they don't teach some other things correctly. You know, we really are a whole Bible church. We're not just a red letter church. You know, some Bibles have the red letters. Hey, if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me, right? But that's not how it works, all right? We're not just a New Testament church. We don't just use the New Testament scriptures. We use the whole Bible because it's all the Word of God and it's all useful. And Jesus says to teach them to obey everything. That means everything, not just the red letters, not just the New Testament words. That means everything. You know, in our church we have a lingo or some lingo. Uh, we call it... Uh, we do have lingo. <laughs> one of our one of our lingos or phrases that we like to use are uh, discipleship partners or disciplers. And what that means is that you have somebody who is directly invested in your salvation, in your life, and your relationship with God. And the discipleship partners, or uh, yeah, discipleship partners, it kind of starts off as a teacher and a student. Uh, but the ultimate goal of uh, discipleship partners is to be grow into a peer-to-peer -peer relationship. Uh, you know, and if we teach people to obey that, well, guess what? They're going to do the very thing that Jesus said to do, which is go and make disciples of all nations, to baptize them, and then to teach them to obey. And you kind of have this line, goes on and on. I mean, Jesus knew what he was talking about. You know, you know maybe, uh, maybe the reason that some churches... Many churches, in fact, none that I've found besides like this one, uh, don't do this as a practice. Uh, it might be because it's kind of hard. It's hard. It's easier not to. Uh, it's easier just to sort of like be casual with somebody than to be invested in somebody. If you're casual, you can't get hurt. If you're casual, you can't get frustrated. If you're casual, you can't really be wrong because, hey, you know, I mean, you know, whatever. <laughs> But, you know, true discipleship and teaching people to obey everything requires correction. It often requires correction. And correction can be an uncomfortable part of being a Christian, let's face it. Um, not everyone, I was, I'm not going to do a show of hands because somebody's going to be smart, but uh, not everyone loves correction. Amen. Um, and I know this, I know this from being in discipleship partner uh, relationships. I know this from being an usher. Uh, oftentimes, I correct people on ushering things, and they're very nice about it, so thank you, but uh, <laughs> it's, they don't like it, I'll tell you what, uh, but it's necessary, because if we're going to do it, we're going to do it right, because we're doing it for God, amen? Yeah. Correction. Let's open up to Proverbs chapter 12. Woo! And when you get there, I want you all, everyone, I want everyone to read this. Proverbs chapter 12, and when you get there, I want you to silently read to yourself <laughs> Proverbs chapter 1. Uh, sorry, Proverbs 12 in verse 1. Everyone read it. <laughs> Some people are still searching. <laughs> Let's read it together, shall we? Yeah. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 1. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. But whoever hates correction is stupid! <laughs> stupid! Yeah. Is that not true? Yeah. It's funny here. We, we, see, we see what God's feelings are on people who don't take correction well. God views that person as stupid. Have you guys ever taken correction not well? 
<laughs> what does God think about that? <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> exactly. You know what? I, I and I'm not immune to this. I I'm, I might be one of the more stupid people up here, or stupidest, yeah. stupider. <laughs> you know, recently I was a little bit stupid. I just want to share with you guys. Uh, I had a conversation with a, a fellow disciple, and uh, this conversation. Uh, if you can call it that, uh, was a good long while of me getting corrected. <laughs> um, and it caught me off guard. Uh, I didn't really necessarily like it. I, in fact, I didn't like it. Uh, I didn't like maybe what was said. I also didn't like how it was said. So it would have been very easy for me to be stupid. And I was. I was stupid because I didn't like how it was said. So therefore, I don't need to take what was said. Maybe. You guys ever been there? <laughs> but you know, even if somebody corrects you in a way that you don't like, it is your obligation as a disciple to separate the wheat from the chaff. Amen. Amen. Throw away the stuff that they didn't say or how you liked, and just take the correction for what it is. It's correction. It's it's discipline. And if you love discipline, God says that you are a lover of knowledge. You know, we, we've got to be smart, you guys. The challenge, don't be stupid. <laughs> Just don't be stupid. That being said, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15 says we've got to speak the truth in love. Okay? Yeah. And that's really what discipling is. Discipling really is somebody who is involved in your life, who is mature, spiritually speaking, uh, who is going to invest themselves into your life. And they're going to tell you some things that you may need to change. They may give you some correction. And it's their job to speak the truth in love. Right. Uh, so when we speak the truth, guys, let's just speak it in love. Amen. Yeah. And that goes for me, too, because I've been guilty, super guilty, stupid. Yeah. And, you know, don't fall into this thing where you, think, you don't think you need to learn or to learn to be taught to obey. Uh, because everybody does. The apostles, the, every disciple in history, and you know what? Even Jesus himself. You can check it out in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8. It's amazing. You know, I, uh, in, my, in my former life, I was uh, in the military. I was a soldier. And, uh, and I, really, I really enjoyed it. It was a great time. It was a great time. Um, and I think something that I've carried from that, that serves me today, I think, largely, uh, it, I'm not really like a why guy, you know. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Devin, Devin's over there laughing, I'm sure Robbie's uh, somewhere. Uh, you don't really ask, like, why? Uh, a lot, Malik, uh, there you go. Go make disciples. Why? Uh, <laughs> you gotta baptize them. Uh, how come? You know, I don't know. <laughs> but you know, I'm not really a why guy. But if you're more inquisitive than me, Let's discover why in Matthew chapter 7. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. In uh, Matthew chapter 7, we'll be in verse 24. And the Bible reads, Therefore, everyone, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the wind blew against that house, and it fell. It fell with a great crash. That's embarrassing. You know, if somebody sees you building your house on the sand, don't be stupid. You take that correction. Somebody comes up to you and says, hey, I want to talk to you about your finances. I want to talk to you about your commitment. 
let's talk about your attendance. You know, you're pretty gone. You're pretty absent. Your Bible knowledge, listen, you've been a disciple for a long time. And you don't know the basics. we got to talk about this. Let's talk about your evangelism. I want to talk to you about your work ethic. I want to talk to you about your priorities. Your time management. You guys, don't be stupid. <laughs> and what does that look like? What does it look like to be stupid? I mean, just imagine this guy, right? He's building his house on sand. And the wise guy... He's not just a wise guy, he's a nice guy. So he walks by and he says, hey man, you know there's some rock under there if you just dig. And the foolish guy says, hey man, how about you just mind your own business? Let me build my house and you just stay out of it. How's that sound? You wanna to talk to me about my money? Who are you? It's my money. That's between me and God, you stay out of it. You question my commitment? I mean, I know I'm not there all the time, but God knows my heart. Or maybe, hey, let's talk about your evangelism. Okay. <laughs> Isn't that stupid? So why is it important to obey, not just to know, not just to teach, but to teach obedience? Why is it important? Well, because if you don't, it's going to crash. It's going to crash. Your whole life is going to crash. Your bank account's going to crash. Your relationship's going to crash. Your marriage is going to crash. If it's not built on the rock, it's going to crash. Anything not built on the rock will fail and it will crash. How about your day? Build your day on the rock. Quiet time, first thing. Meaningful, prayer. Digging in the scriptures. Open hearted. I don't want to be that guy who goes up there on judgment day and suddenly finds out everything is crashing down. We've got to not be stupid, folks. You know, a question I often ask myself, and I encourage we all ask ourselves, is am I built on the rock? Am I building my life? Not only that, am I teaching others to build on the rock as well? You know, these discipling relationships, they're so crucial, absolutely crucial. You know, you are, you are directly involved in someone's salvation. Now, in the end of the day, it is up to you as an individual. However, we gotta do it God's way, amen? But that's somebody who is actively invested in your salvation. They wanna get you to heaven. They're not trying to make you feel stupid. Or embarrassed. You know, I mean, I'm sure we've all felt that way. So have I. But we've got to love knowledge on this. We can't reject correction. You know, I look at the people that I'm in discipling relationships with, and I ask myself, is this time that I'm spending with them, am I teaching them obedience so that they will go out and do the same? They will go out and be fruitful? They will go out and make disciples? How about when I'm done? 10 years, maybe when they're 70, 80 plus years, you know, God willing, are they going to be faithful to God because of what I taught them in those formative years? You know, this is, this is long-term stuff we're thinking about, you know? Because you don't know when the storm's going to come, and if your house is not built on the rock, the Bible says it's going to come down to the loud crash. Amen. So we teach to obey. We don't just teach. We're not a school. I mean, we have to know. But we teach to obey. All right, amen? Amen, you guys. So, so when we do things the way Jesus did it, we get results. Amen? So I, I really don't know if there's any churches out there. Uh, maybe if there are, you can show me. But I guarantee you, at this church, you will get the discipling that you need and that is commanded by God. Amen? Yeah. Point, that was point number three, taught to obey. You know, the, uh, the final words here. Let's look at Matthew chapter 28 right. one more time. Right. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. And the last sentence there. It says, you do these things. And surely, surely.
surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. You see, when we are doing the things that God requires of us, He is absolutely with us all the time. Uh, you know, and we live in such a, a, a time and a place where we can really, that guy over there can go be a disciple. I mean, I can just walk up to him. And there's no fear of retaliation. Okay, so here's, here's a saying that I like. And many of us have heard this. Um, how, many, how many people have heard the saying, freedom isn't free? Freedom isn't free. You know, that's a, that's a term that, uh, or a phrase or saying that is often used in cooperation with our military. Um, it really means that um, this, the freedoms that we have in this country, and um, I know it's Hawaii, it's mixed feelings, but whether you're grateful or you're ungrateful to be an American, there are many freedoms that you enjoy today that, that a large percentage of the globe do not get to participate in. Freedom of speech, freedom to defend yourself, freedom to practice your religion, freedom to vote, freedom to participate in the free market. A lot of these countries outside the U.S. actually do not let you do these things. You are actually prohibited by the government from doing that. And freedom isn't free means that that wasn't just given for nothing. Somebody died for that. People have died since the founding of this nation up until the present day so that we can enjoy these things. Comes at a cost. You know, I love the, uh, oh boy, New Hampshire. Uh, state motto, live free or die. Live free or die, that's a state motto. And you know, as great as American freedom is, as much as I love it and I'm proud of it and appreciate it, there's a different kind of available, uh, freedom available. And it's not just for Americans. It's freedom for everyone. And it's freedom from sin. It's freedom from guilt. It's freedom to have joy, to have a clear conscience. It's freedom to even dream beyond this life. That freedom did not come for free. Someone had to die for your freedom. And that someone is Jesus Christ. Before we take the communion, I want to share with you guys one final scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. You know, those of us who have freedom in Christ, I think the best thing you could ever give to God is to live our lives for him. As we reflect on the cross, let us never forget the sacrifice that God made for our freedom. Let's pray.